So it's lovely to see you, Lisa. How are you getting on with everything? I'm doing great, Val. Yeah, great to see you too. Um, myself and Val have been working together for a little while now. We'll go into that in a bit more detail, but she's just been a fantastic mentor and a friend at this stage. <laughs> she's, on my, she's on my speed dial for uh, resin emergencies. <laughs> Um, so I, I think we're probably, there's a good few people signing in, so we're probably good to get going. Hello, everybody. Great to see so many people. Hey, Sweden. May, Pakistan, Austria. Wow, this is just incredible. India, Arizona. Love it. Right, um, so just uh, we'll go through a little bit of the flow today. I'm just going to do a quick introduction so you know a little bit about myself. Then I'm going to pass you over to the lovely Valerie so she can tell you a little bit about herself too. Um, then we have a few topics that we kind of felt were really relevant, especially for people starting off in the resin world. Uh, and then a few of you have also sent in some questions to us um, over the last couple of weeks, which is brilliant. Thank you very much. Because at the end of the day, well, first of all, we want you to have fun. It's Sunday after all. Um, we, we want you to get some value out of today. So if you have questions, you can pop them in the chat. I'll try and keep an eye on them. Um, hopefully I'll get to them all. If I do miss them, you can reach out to one of us privately afterwards. But uh, I said, let's have a little bit of fun. Keep it nice and interactive. Absolutely. I think uh, just before you start, I had a mm -hmm. question. We will be trying to save this live. Um, having never done one before, it will work. So keep your fingers crossed, everybody. Hi, Kimberly. Um, keep your fingers crossed that we will be able to save this live um, on our feed and hopefully on story at some point today. <laughs> Bear with us at the first. <laughs> hopefully between us we'll manage it well. <laughs> Great. So my name is Lisa and I am based in Ireland, just outside Dublin. I got into resin last year because I actually bought a resin picture and whenever I walked into my sitting room it just brought me such joy like it was just such a beautiful piece to look at so the more I kind of looked at it the more curious I got and I started um, looking into resin and how to do it and stuff like that and I did a lot and a lot of research um, and then I'm actually also a business and life coach and one of the First things I say to people is invest in yourself. So while I was looking up YouTube and, you know, trying all the free resources, which are incredible, and there's so many artists who share their work, and I just love how they do that. It's just so generous, and, and it's a great resource. But for me, I wasn't really getting the tailored questions that I needed, um, and I, I tend to ask a lot of questions. So I, um, I follow quite a few people on Instagram who do resin, but just I reached out to Val because I've been following her for a while. I absolutely loved her work. And uh, when I seen she was doing classes, I just was like, this is perfect. So, Val, I think we've probably had five, if not six, or if maybe more, I've another one booked in with you now next week. Um, and the value I get from Val's courses are just brilliant. So I kind of felt that there was something that we could give here because like resin's great to, to work with, but as we all know, it's so expensive, you know, and it can, it's very timely as well. So if anything goes wrong, it can cost, you know, uh, it can be quite again, it's expensive to, to fix. So hopefully today from the tips that Val would give you, you'll be able to save some money, save some time, really hone in on your craft and um, yeah, just, just get some value out of today. So that's me, uh, Val, I'll pass you over to you so you can tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Lisa. Um, well, I started in about three years ago, uh, totally accidentally. I always done it, but by trade and career, I'm a teacher and chef in luxury hotels, in particular in India. And, but I always loved to paint, and I came across a resin painting online um, about three years ago, and I thought, wow, this is. So I started doing dirty pours in acrylic and then covering them with resin, and it was a total and complete disaster. Um, I found that working with acrylic paint and do it, doing dirty pores, sound is not good. Uh, okay, I'm on maximum. So can you hear me properly, Lisa? Yeah, I can hear you properly, Val. Yeah, I don't know what's... Okay, well, hopefully get back yeah. to me. Your sound is not that good. Uh, okay, I don't know what you to fix, to be honest, because my connection is good. Hmm, and yeah, mine seems pretty good too. Let's sound very poor. Okay, that's problematic. Uh, uh, 
it's just choppy sound oh. well that's no good it's good now okay fantastic yeah so, okay very long story short I worked with acrylic paints and dirty pores, kept it resin, it was a nightmare, I made a mess, and I de decided to remove all the side of things and concentrate on the resin itself. And that was it, I became addicted. Um, I took a year to really get into everything, get to know my work around resin before I made my company, I started selling and then in the over the last three months I started teaching online and helping students obviously I'm not a charity I'm not Mother Teresa so they are you know paying classes but I've had some fantastic feedback as you know for those who follow me I do try and share quite a lot for free on Instagram and that's it we're here today to help and answer some of the basic questions that Lisa may have on resin artwork and any of you may have. So off to you, Lisa. Brilliant, brilliant. So yeah, we've picked out a few of the main topics we felt were most relevant, especially for people starting out. And I think the obvious one to, for, any, for us to start with is safety, because safety is so important when it comes to resin. It is quite complex. Um, so Val, if you could tell everybody, I suppose, why it's important and then what, what equipment they'd need just for the safety. Absolutely. Um, so resin has moved on quite a lot over the last few years, and it is becoming less and less toxic. Depending on the type of resin that you are buying, you will get bad to extremely good quality resins. However, yeah. saying that they are becoming better and better, they are still toxic in a way. We don't exactly know how much toxicity they are putting out there with us. So my advice is to work in a specific room. Um, when I first started, I was working upstairs in the la on the dining room table where everybody was there, the dogs were there, so it wasn't a great environment. So regardless of the size of room that you could have to your, at your disposal, I firmly suggest that you find a little space to yourself where you can do your resin artwork in peace, you're not intruding on anybody, and once you start, some basic safety guidelines are old clothes, because resin is really messy. So wear old clothes, put an old apron on. If you've got long hair, tie your hair up because it's gonna get into your resin or you're gonna put resin on your hair, so tie it back. And then in terms of equipment, gloves all the time. Um, do not work with resin without gloves because when you do, you will end up having some issues, some scars. I've got a few. Um, I didn't see the resin was there, and I it. and then of course you scratch it, and it's really not good to have. Skin. So there's plenty of gloves out there. Choose whichever brand or type that you like. And then the next biggest thing is a respirator mop. Now there are plenty of them out there. This one is a 3M. It's a fabulous brand, but they tend to be quite expensive. I purchased both of these on Amazon. This M um, feels a little bit heavier and better made than the Air. This one feels maybe a little bit lighter, but the problem with 3M is that it is an expensive brand you end up having to buy the mask, the cartridges themselves, and the replacement filters separately. So it ends up being quite a costly investment. The Air Gear Pro, however, comes into this little package from Amazon, at least Amazon FR, I am in front. And you get everything you need for the mask, as well as protective goggles, goggles. So where I'm concerned, that's great. So in terms of personal protection, gloves, old clothes, apron, tie your hair back, a, a PPE respirator mask, and a well-ventilated room, 
and that's it. You're ready to go into mm -hmm. your own personal safety. Absolutely. Safety first, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sorry, guys. I really don't know. Um, sound is choppy. How the sound. Um, with both Lisa and I have got perfect internet connection. My sound is on full. So I don't really know what to do to correct it, to be honest. So I can hear you perfectly now, Vaz. I don't, yeah, I don't know if it's... Yeah. Hopefully you can hear hear enough of it to make sense of <laughs> all this. I love the information that you're getting. Can you let, yeah, if you, if you could let us know, we'll, I'll go on to the next point, but if you could kind of just keep us posted to see if the sound isn't, um, isn't great, if you're missing too much of it, just, yeah, keep us informed. I'll keep an eye on the chat. Cool. It's fine for me. Okay, great. Um, technology. In the beginning, Val sounds fine. Uh, it's when you, perhaps when you move back to the mic, Val, so uh, I can hear you. Okay. I want to get too close to the mic because you're getting a full on shot of me, <laughs> wrinkles and all. I would have preferred well out in the background. Uh, sorry, I missed all these things. Hang on, let me go back a few chats. Um, when both of you have the mic on. I'll just stay very quiet when you're talking, Val. It's probably the easiest thing, thing to do. Is there a way to mute one when the other is booking? Okay. Unfortunately, I don't think there is a way. All right. So I'll, just, I'll just stay nice and quiet. We'll mute, we'll mute when he's speaking and we'll try that. Great. Okay, well, you're getting to see a lot of me today then. <laughs> More than I was hoping for. Never. So, yeah, you've gone through some of the safety stuff, which is great. There's also a lot of other equipment that people are going to need if they fancy doing resin. So, can you just tell us a little bit about all the other materials or the equipment you'd recommend to go along with it? Absolutely, Lisa. So, basically, you need some basic tools and one of the things that you will need is something like this, which I highly recommend. It's the buddy kit from Just For You Online UK. Both of them are made out of silicon. So the great thing about these is that you can scrunch it once your resin is fully cured. So in about 24 hours, and then you can just peel out the resin it comes out in the chunk, and then you just need to wipe it with a little bit of alcohol. Your stirrer stick, same thing, when it's cured, you just bend it a few times and you can just peel off the resin directly off it. The great thing about these tools, whether it is your mixing, your little cups to mix your resin and color, and little stirring sticks and pigment sticks, is that they can be reused over and over again. So you are not A, wasting as much money, constantly buying paper cups, constantly buying stirring sticks, and more importantly, where I'm concerned, we're kind of saving a little bit on waste and the environment. Resin, where I'm concerned, is not really environmentally friendly type of artwork. So the less we can put in our dust bins, the better. And buying the silicon products really goes a long way to um, saving on your waste. Yeah, absolutely. And that was a mistake actually I was making at the beginning. I was using things once and throwing them away. And I was like, this can't possibly be the way. There was so much waste. <laughs> it nearly put me off. But until I spoke to you, Val, and you were showing me ways that I can reuse things and you know, advice on the silicone and stuff like that, which really helped. Yeah, and brought down the expenses as, yeah, as well as better for the environment, which is very important. Absolutely. In terms of tools, I have two. I use two tools. So this one is called a heat gun, a heat torch, my apologies. And it is, you can purchase it from Amazon. I'm really sorry about the state of mine. Um, it's done three years at the moment and it's still running strong. You could prevent all this mess by putting some cling film around it and it would keep it nice and clean, which I had done at the beginning. 
and then it got really dirty. I removed it and I forgot to cover it again. And this one is basically used to remove the last bubbles on your artwork. The problem with this is that because it is a naked flame, we have to be careful of how we use it, not to come too close to the resin, in order not A, to burn our resin and to, to burn our mold. Today's topic, guys, is all about helping beginners. I see a couple of questions here. So it's all the basic questions for beginners. The second tool I recommend is this heat gun. Mine is Attack Life. And the reason I love mine is because it has three positions from low, medium, and high. And it is an electric tool. We use it primarily to blow bubbles, move the resin around, especially when we are doing bigger pieces of work, create cells, and do lacing. So when you're doing an ocean pour, you can, we will use this particular item. When you want to create cells or lacing, you will use that gun. So really, these two tools are the only two tools you need for any kind of resin artwork. Yes, I, have, I do online live classes. So if at the end of the lesson, you'd send me a DM, I can run through the classes that I do with you. And that's for Nesrinos06. Um, cell work, I'm sorry, Resin Berry, we're not going to cover today because that's a huge topic. So today we're really trying to cover, um, hi Lucy, we're really trying to cover beginners' issues, what tools to have, uh, differences between some products so that at least the beginners can have a little bit more of an insight on the world of resin and try to avoid some of these mistakes. It's a, can you? I, I, keep an eye, I can keep an eye on the chat there, Val, you don't worry. Okay, cool. So those are the two tools that I recommend. And I weigh my resin. I don't measure my resin. So I use this scale. They're just simple digital scales that I purchased on Amazon France. You can buy them anywhere. But you buy digital scales, make sure that the plastic is relatively wide so that you can put all your uh, mixing containers on top because otherwise, if it's a really small platform, you're going to struggle to weigh your bigger containers. In terms of other basic tools, you're then looking at your pigments and molds. So, you know, that the range of these products is absolutely gigantic. Does anybody have any question on tools and equipment? Uh, uh, we're actually getting... Do you prefer silicon or plastic cups? I don't like plastic cups. And the reason... But let me see if I can find one. Yeah. So the reason the reason I do not like plastic cups is because I prefer when I do my pores, whoops, I like to pinch my cups so I can achieve a controlled pour. I can control the amount of resin that comes out of my cup. Plastic cups have a tendency to break when we pinch them. Um, although the resin comes out of them really well, I'm not keen on them. So I have two types. I have these paper cups, which I try to reuse as often as I can until they're too solid and too rigid to use. And otherwise, I really like the silicon cups 
because it's so easy to remove the resin. I purchased all of mine and all the little sticks that you see from Just For You Online UK. I've had them for over a year and a half. And as you can see, you know, it's, it's clean, it's tidy. Um, I put them in warm water, warm soapy water after a while, and then just give them a clean and they're ready to go again. Brilliant. We have a couple of other questions there, Val. Somebody's asked, what's the difference between the heat gun versus the flame? So, I, I've just explained, this is a heat torch. It has a naked flame. Can you see that, guys? So, yeah. the naked flame, we have to be careful with, because obviously, it can burn your resin or burn your mold. And the reason for using that is basically to remove the light bubbles that are appearing on your artwork before you cover it and leave it alone. The heat gun is more gentle. It has three positions. It is not a naked flame. It is an electric um, heat source. You can monitor and control the amount of power you put through it. And we use that to a, blow bubbles, to create cells, create lacing, do ocean wave, do the waves when you're doing an ocean pour, and to move around resin if you want to combine colors on a painting or a geode, and it is to move your resin on your um, artwork. And actually, somebody's asking there, what are bubbles? Oh, lovely resin bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell us yeah i'm delighted uh, i think it was gandhi resin art that you don't know what bubbles are it means you're not getting any and that's amazing bubbles Absolutely. tend to occur in resin because we've introduced air to resin the minute we start mixing resin with our uh, hardener air is incorporated into our mix and we tend to get bubbles so one of the things, one of the things that is hardest to do with working with resin is actually getting rid of these pesky little bubbles that appear. More or less depends how you've worked your resin, how you've um, worked your color pigments into your resin. The slower you work, the slower you work and mix your resin and your hardener, the less bubbles you are going to get. You have to remember to mix your resin and hardener for three minutes and no less, and to mix it really, really slowly. It is not a pancake batter. They're not egg whites. We are doing the opposite. We don't want to incorporate air into our resin. So we want to do it really slowly. Great. We're getting lots of questions through here, Val, but I think it's best if we just go through some of the topics. And guys, keep putting your questions through. I'm taking them down, but we'll cover them. Um, we'll come back to them at the end, if that's okay. Absolutely, Lisa. Brilliant. Um, now, Val, have you covered everything on equipment needed? One more. There is one more that I really recommend. It is not an expensive item. And it is this isopropanol alcohol. You can purchase it on any of the Amazon. It is 99% uh, pure. It is not that expensive. If you can, purchase yourself a little spray bottle. You can see this little spray here and decant some of your alcohol in it. And that serves for multiple reasons. Clean your hands with, clean your surfaces with it, but you can also use it to spray your resin artwork to remove and pop some of those surface bubbles. So if you do not have tools, although I really highly recommend that you have them because you will struggle without those heat tools, but you can use the alcohol if you are working in particular in very, very small molds, like crystal molds, 
um, or very tiny um, little molds that have a lot of hollows, then I would use the alcohol spray instead of the heat torch. I never use the heat torch in uh, crystal molds or anything that's really small because chances are I will burn the edges of my mold. And you will know that you burn the edges of your mold because when you try to remove say, your coaster, as you're taking it out of the mold, your mold will have stuck to the actual coaster. And that's when you know that you have burned your mold. If that happens, chances are you will tear your mold and then it's unusable because either you, ha you will have a split or break or a piece of the actual silicon of the mold will be stuck to your coaster and the next time you pour, you will have that same problem in that mold again. So you've basically ruined that mold. Great, great. I just see Esther, you're asking a great question there just regarding ratios. We're going to come back to um, how much to mix now in the topic after the next one. So just keep an ear out for that. Great. So Val, you've gone through um, all the equipment needed, which is brilliant. Yeah. And then something you stressed for me when I started and it made great sense. And you also had a good analogy about when you're cooking, which made, made, made it even more, make more sense to me. But how, why is it so important to be organized and set up everything right from the beginning? As beginners, we tend to always panic a little bit. And um, if some of you that are watching are cooks, you will know the value of a mise en place. And a mise en place in French means to have everything ready in front of you. Because resin has a specific working time, in it you mix your resin and your hardener together. You have a specific time to work with that resin before it becomes too hot or what we call it starts to cure and you can no longer use it. So I firmly advise to all of you beginners out there to do that as your last thing to do. Make sure that in front of you on your table, you have prepared everything you need. So I am talking about having made a decision on what molds you want to pour into, what colors you're going to be using, have in your mind or written on paper what effect you're trying to achieve, have your heat tool next to you, your mixing cups, basically have everything in front of you so that you don't have to go hunting in your room or in your drawers or in your cupboards anything that you may need for that particular because from the minute you have mixed the resin and the hardener together your time starts then and if you're not ready if you're not prepared you're going to start stressing you're going to start making mistakes so be prepared be organized be ready brilliant that's great Bob. we're getting so many questions through this is brilliant and um, yes we are going to have the live saved hopefully on our uh, instagram after this so you can refer back and um, so absolutely makes sense Val, to be organized because as a resin is quite the messy uh, substance so <laughs> you can find if you're not organized everything around you is, is, is uh, sticky and <laughs> um, so this is something that seems a really important topic is um, the difference between mica and uh, pigments. So mica is the powder and pigments is the liquid. So uh, what's the difference in mixing them? What kind of different effects do you get from using both and the ratios? So you have uh, three types of products. I should say maybe two very basic ones. The first one is a paste. Ouch. So pigment paste, and they can be quite thick, like this one that comes. This is, as for those who know me, know that I'm a white fanatic, white, gold, black, they're my colors, as well as pink. Um, so this is a pigment paste, and it reacts very differently to the resin than the pigment powders. This is a mica powder, and as you can see, 
It has, let me grab some. I don't know if you can spot it very well. You can't, hang on, let me put, well, actually you might spot it more on my finger. So this is a mica powder and it comes from a natural stone mineral, which is shiny. As opposed to the pigment powders, which come from color rocks, so they don't need to be from natural stones, but um, pigment powders are not shiny. They are matte. It is worth having the three different types or at least the two different types of products within your stock. So powder or pigment paste, because you can achieve very, very different looks. I will, give me a second. I didn't bring, put them next to me. I'll just grab two coasters to show yeah. Actually, while we're waiting for Val there, somebody did ask a question about cells earlier on, and that um, white, supreme white from Just For You and uh, UK is um, fantastic for creating cells and that wave effect, as well as just being a white pigment. So um, if you're interested in cells, it's definitely a product to have in, the, have in your bag. Oh, absolutely. It is the only white that I now use. Um, I use it for my waves. I use it for geodes. I use it for cell making, lacing with it is absolutely incredible. Yeah. So uh, it's for me, it is one of the basic items you need to have in your store. Mm -hmm. So to show you the difference between the effects you get, on this side is the black pigment paste. And on that side is the black pigment, the black mica powder. As you can see from the black side, there's no effect. It's a full, shiny, but flat, solid color. But on this side, we have shine, shimmer, pearlescence. We have effect. We have reaction between the pigment powder, the mica powder, and the resin. So we have two very different looks on at the side. So it's worth having both of these types of products in your stock with materials because you can achieve very different looks. And as you grow into your art creations and making resin, you will understand what works, what doesn't work, what you can achieve with one product and with the other. And to be honest, guys, the only way to know is for you guys to experiment. We cannot tell you everything online. We cannot show you everything on Instagram. It's not possible. All of us spend hours and hours and hours each day experimenting, trying new things, putting different things together. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work, but that's the way you will grow. That's the way you are going to understand resin and how it moves, what you can do with it, what you cannot do with it, how much of it you can control. So you have to go, you have to get out there and experiment and play with your products and your resin as much as you can. I understand there's a cost to it, but we are all in that same place, in that same situation. If you don't try, you just won't understand. Absolutely. And it's important, Val, as well, isn't it, to look on the instructions so they know the ratio of how much pigment to add to uh, the resin itself, because you could risk it not setting, which... Yes. So when you purchase your resin, whatever the resin may be, written on the bottles of your resin is written the mixing rate. So... I'm showing you the resin just for you online UK and on the bottle, sorry, wrong side, on, on the bottle, it tells you the mixing ratio of this particular resin. And there are two vital pieces of information, whether you are mixing the resin 
by volume, which means you are measuring in milliliters, or whether you are measuring your, sorry, you are weighing your resin. So actually weighing it on the scales and using grams or kilograms. Each mixing ratio, hi Alexandra, each uh, mixing ratio is different. So pay attention to the resin. And I firmly suggest you stick to a routine. Either weigh your resin or measure your resin in milliliters. Don't jump from one to the other because you're going to get confused within the mixing ratios, which are different. And the reason they're different is because hardener is actually heavier than resin. So when we weigh it using grams or kilograms, the hardener is heavier than the resin. So it weighs more. So we end up having to put less hardener than we would resin in order to get our same weight. Brilliant. If you uh, too much pigment. So Nezrin Magdi, hello darling. Good to see you here. When, what happens when you add too much pigment or powder to the resin? Let me show you what happens. It can easily happen. So be patient and measure everything. Don't do anything by eye. So, this piece was made two months ago. And... <laughs> <laughs> So why is it doing that? It's doing this because I put far too much black pigment paste in my resin. There is a ratio of 2 to 5% when you are mixing color to resin. I know Everybody says, how the hell do I figure out what 2 or 5% is? I know it's very difficult. You can be a little bit more free when you are using a pigment powder or a mica powder. However, when you are using pastes, you need to be really careful. So obviously, look at how much resin you have in your cup or in your container. Try and judge what 2 to 5% is. And like salt in cooking, it's a lot easier to add color than it is to take it away. Once you've added the color into your resin, it's impossible to remove. And chances are you will have ruined the resin because you will have changed the ratio between hardener and resin and that chemical reaction between the two components is no longer going to happen. And you will end up with a that will never cure. As I say, this piece has been sitting and I keep it for my to show my students what happens when you make <laughs> when you make a mistake. So this is never going to cure. It's frustrating if you're doing that on very large pieces. So, you know, small amounts of color at a time so that you can control it. You can always add a little bit more, but you can't take it away. Absolutely, great advice. And it's something that can even happen experienced people. So be patient with your resin, measure everything, <laughs> get it right. 3D, the best resin, um, in my opinion, is a thick, um, thick medium viscosity resin if you want to try and achieve um, flowers, any kind of 3D look in your coasters or in your drink. So something that is quite thick because the resin is not going to spread itself. It is going to stay quite compact into the mold you've put it in and you will have that layer effect with your products. Brilliant. The next point, Val, as you know, is a bit of a pain point for me because I have tried several different uh, surfaces and one in particular that has driven me quite mad <laughs> um, is what surface do you recommend? 
I prefer to work on wood. So, Me too. <laughs> either pieces that are untreated, this is plain, this is what we called a crilled panel. So it has a support at the back, but the wood has not been treated. It is still in its raw form. Or you can purchase from Just For You Online UK, and I know they've got brand, a whole bunch of new boards coming in. Boards that are already coated and prepared, so you can pour directly on them. You don't need to do anything to these boards other than protect them with tape. If you end up, I prefer, as I say, to use wood. Resin, I find, is heavy. I've worked at the beginning a lot with canvases, and I didn't know any better. I was just starting out. My canvases were dipping in the center. Um, I found my resin was pooling in the center. I was having all these issues. And at the time, I didn't know how to sort it out and what to do. If you want to work with a camera, which I understand because they are cheaper, they are lighter to send, to post, um, you can find a lot more of them in every dimension that you like. So in terms of utility and versatility, canvases are a lot easier. I highly recommend that you work on your canvas first before you start pouring. And you can harden your canvas in two ways. You pretend, pretend that this is a canvas, turn it around because I don't actually have any more. Turn it upside down and wet, don't flood it, but wet the inside of your canvas and let it dry completely. The first thing that's going to do is that it is going to tighten the whole canvas itself. If you are working on a very large canvas, you're going to do, need to do a lot more than just wet the inside. And the best way to do that is to cut a piece of polystyrene foam, quite a thick one, fit it into your inside, the dimension and size of the inside of your canvas, and then you can strengthen it with support or other pieces of polystyrene before you start. Sorry about just a question there. Did you get that from um, the Just For You UK website? Somebody's just asking there. No. Your, your board? So this board, the white board, I got from Just For You Online UK. They have several types. Um, I know they're out of stock of some things at the moment, but is coming. It has left Russia out of the boards. The shipment has gone, so hopefully, fingers crossed, they will receive it soon. These are you can get the ones with the holes already for your clock design, or you can get the plain ones in different sizes if you want to just do a pour, or if you want to do a clock, then all you'll need to do is actually pierce it to put your mechanism after. Brilliant. Welcome, Nasreen and Mandy. See you soon. Um, so, as I say, I prefer to work with wood, but that's the personal preference of mine. Um, I don't have a lot of time, so I like wood. It is solid, heavier to post, more expensive, but I do save a lot of time working with it, so I prefer it. And I think to bring us to the next point, how do you prep the surface mm -hmm. of either your wooden boards or your canvas boards? You can leave them as they are. You have to prep the, um, the surface of the boards. It's not absolutely necessary. I don't do it all the time. But if you do, if you want to do it, there are two choices. 
you can either oh. cover them with just basic acrylic paint whatever brand it doesn't matter and i would put two or three colors on my wood i'm oh, sorry two or three layers of color on my wood and i would choose the color that will go with the rest of my design so if i'm going to work with a major black paint and I would start with a black paint. Acrylic paint is great. It dries very fast. It doesn't have much of a scent. It's very cheap. You can get them anywhere. Or if you want texture, then I would recommend Gesso. Now, Gesso dries a lot harder than acrylic paint. It is also more of a textural product. So if you want to achieve texture, Gesso will be the product to you. The only downside, in my opinion, is that it smells quite strongly. So I don't particularly like it. And it is obviously a lot more expensive than acrylic paint. Try both and what you prefer. Brilliant, Val. And just seeing as we're on surfaces, a very important point to cover, um, and like we'll say, say people a lot, a lot of time is like when you're prepping, how to tape the board. So and stop the lovely drips from underneath. I don't know if you can see the name. It is called Blue Tape, and it is available in two layers, in two uh, thicknesses. And I use it to protect all my work on my boards. From the minute that we start, I don't pour any resin on the boards before I start taping. And the best way to do this is to make sure that you have, I'll just cut off a piece so I can show it to you like this. When you tape, now let's see. You want to make sure that your edge is right on the edge. You do not want your tape to be coming up like this or even a little bit because what happens is if it is over the edge of your board, you are going to have issues later on taking the tape off and more importantly you are going to create a dam in some areas now creating a dam is fine but we don't always want that i just want my resin to be able to flow over the edges of my tape so it's nice and smooth and at the same level so when i'm putting my tape on i want to make sure that it is exactly at the same level as my board and then press on it really 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 well either with your fingers or with a stirring stick and as you can see it is completely flat there is no lap there is no edge of my tape over the side and then when you're finished and i think you may have seen a video i put online not too long ago when you have finished with your resin with your work and it's time to remove the tape all you need to do is grab a heat gun turn it on heat your tape and then obviously here it's easy because there's no resin you will be able to peel it off really really easy when you peel it off make sure you peel towards the work as opposed to towards you so peel it off towards the work as opposed to pulling the tape towards you or downwards because it will rip it and it could cause damage to the layer of resin at the top. Brilliant. That's 
Great, Val. And so actually, somebody just asked a question there um, just regarding silicone, uh, so the liquid latex as opposed to tape. Uh, liquid latex is absolutely fantastic to you if you want to do a flood coat out of a mold. So you would use the latex. You would use the latex. This is natural latex. I bought it on Amazon. Um, it is this color. And what you would do is you would, if I wanted to flood coat this coaster, and it's already taken out of the mold. This is my top. This is the area I want to flat coat. I would turn it around and I would put latex on the underneath. If I want to, I could latex the edges, let it dry fully until it becomes transparent, turn it back around, propping it on a yogurt pot, and then flood coat my coaster, let it cure for 24 hours, and when it's fully cured, turn it back round, and I would just literally peel off the latex. So in my personal opinion, that is the only time I use latex. The one time I tried to put latex on wood uh, was on a cheese board I wanted to make. I thought I will try putting latex and instead of using scotch tape and it didn't work thankfully i had put some scotch tape but the latex it, itself didn't actually work with the wood it kind of started because wood is porous it actually started going in and it didn't have the same um accuracy in its effect so it didn't stop the resin from sticking in the same way so i prefer tape Yes, it's a bit of a farce, but, you know, it takes five minutes to get it done. And where I'm concerned, good prep ends up giving you good work, good results. Preparation is important when you're doing resin art. So, you know, do your prep. Don't rush that part. You're not doing yourself a favor. Brilliant. And it's, and it's a really good one, And Before I spoke to you, I think I tried about two or three different tapes and none of them were working. The resin was leaking down the side. I was having to sand it off. It was so time consuming. And that one tip from you in itself saved me money and saved me a lot of time. That's for sure. <laughs> so Scotch tape um, is, is the name of it. Somebody just um, asked in the chat there. Yes. Blue, Scotch blue. So Scotch blue tape available in two different widths. Uh, from Amazon, as well as all your DIY stores. And yes, you're going to spend a little bit of money on your tape, but oh my God, the time you will save afterwards trying to get rid of those drips. And I think when I showed the video, someone asked me a question. Why do I not use one of these instead? So no tape and then use one of these. Yes, by all means, use one of those. It is a dangerous tool. Um, I had quite a nasty accident with it not so long ago, and I have never used it since. I prefer the tape and then the heat gun method, but everybody is different. If you found a way that works for you, then by all means continue. I'm only offering you my personal experience and advice from work I've done and solutions that I found were helpful to me. If they're not helpful to you, and if you found a better way, then that's fantastic. Share them. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. With the, game, the tape for me was a game changer, so I'd highly recommend it. So we've, we've gone through the main topics, Val, and it's just so great to see so many questions coming in. And I'm kind of conscious that we're, we're nearly at the hour. So, um, you know, it's great that there's uh, so many questions and people are interested to find out more. Um, and myself and Valerie were going to run this maybe again in a couple of weeks if there was enough interest. And to be honest, with all these questions, I think, Valerie, that's <laughs> probably not a bad idea. But I'd like to touch on some of them, uh, some of them today for sure. So this is a great one for somebody who's starting out. Like, What piece do you recommend starting out on first? What's the easiest thing to work with? I think I would probably start with um, A, because you're not wasting a lot of resin. 
Sorry, Val, you actually broke up there. Can you repeat that? I would actually start probably with coasters. Um, you know, a set of two or a set of four coasters because you're wasting a lot of resin. It's controllable, so you're not going to make a huge mess. It is within uh, a mold shape, so you're controlled in that environment. You can have a little bit of a play with colors and resin, but you're not wasting too much product if things go wrong. If you start working on a, a, a geode or a, a platter, a, a tray or a painting, you are wasting, you're starting to waste a lot of ingredients and materials if things don't go your way. And it can be quite depressing at the beginning when we make mistakes and things don't turn out the way we hoped they would. So I would definitely start with a set of coasters and then, you know, keep playing with them, keep trying different effects, keep trying different colors, see what differences you get and have some fun with that. Brilliant. Here, um, Here's one. How long does it take resin to dry? So depending on the resin that you are using, there are three stages to resin. The first stage, what we call touch dry. And depending on the height of resin you have in your mold in particular, you can have six to eight or four to six hours before we refer to as touch dry, meaning that you do another layer between four to eight hours, depending on the resin that you are using. Then we have, a, a, if we're using coasters, for example, I know that I can demold my coaster in 24 hours. How so? My resin, which is the premium resin from Just for You Online UK takes 24 hours for it to cure and then it takes seven days before I can send it out or I can use it myself. The heat resin, resin from Just For You Online UK, however, is much longer to cure. So I would say a good 48 hours for a full cure and anywhere between 14 to 21 days before you can package it, use it, or send it out to a customer. So make sure that when you purchase your resin, you look at the information on their website so that you know when it touch dry, when it is cured, and how long it needs to rest before it can be used properly. Key to resin is patience, Val, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Some things can be very quick, but generally it's a slow, it's a quick art to make originally, but then after that there are steps to follow and you have, you need a bit of patience, which for a beginner is a hard thing to um, abide by. I know why. <laughs> the amount of times I have ruined coasters at the beginning because I lifted my lid and I wanted to see what was going on, going on inside them. And I ruined them because I put my finger in it and it wasn't ready. So now I've learned my lesson. I cover my work as soon as I've worked on it and I do not touch it until 24 hours later. Yeah, great, great piece of advice, Val. And that's just questions come in there. When I pour the second coat, and um, because you can layer resin, just for you, those of you who don't know, uh, so when I pour the second coat after drying, the top is not even. It's like there are stains and spots on the coaster. What might the reason be? Sorry, can you? Uh, sorry, I was trying to read another question about the twenty-one days. So it says, when I pour the second coat after drying, the top is not even, and it's like there are stains and spots on the coaster. What might the reason be? Okay, well, first of all, you need to have a level surface. So if your surface isn't level, your artwork is never going to be level. So I, one of the major tools that I did forget to talk about, actually, is a leveler. 
this is how big this one is. Do not buy one that is too small because otherwise it will be useless. And check it in two different ways. This way on your art piece and then that way on your art piece. To make sure your actual surface is level. That's number one. Secondly, resin hates the cold and hates humidity. So we tend to find that a problem will occur on the flood coat, meaning the top transparent coat of our artwork, because something in our atmosphere has gone wrong. If your temperature has dropped and it is no longer between 22 and 24 degrees Celsius, I say Celsius, and your um, humidity level has gone up from 50%, then you are going to start seeing problems with your resin. And it can be lines, it can be stretch marks, it can be opaque areas, it can be dimples. So all these things tend to be created by an, ad an environment that is no longer conducive to the resin curing properly. And also, well, sorry, I, don't, I was taking down questions there. I don't know if you mentioned it, but fingerprints, you gave me a big warning about touching my piece and the oils that are on your fingertips. Absolutely. Um, so that could be causing something. Absolutely. So one of the problems we often find and realize is that if you are dealing with resin that is not finished. So if my coaster had not been flood coated, I would not be touching it with my bare hands because we have oils on our skin and having put my bare hand or my bare finger on the resin, if I still need to do a flood coat, will mean that when I flood coat it, my resin is going to separate and create an area where I put my finger and the oil came in contact. The resin is going to push away from that oil and you will have what we um, talk about symbols or craters and the resin will never go into that oily area. So once you've completely finished your artwork and you know you're never doing any resin on it, you can touch it with your bare hands. But if you are still pouring resin, use gloves. Do not touch your artwork without gloves. And well, just for if somebody does that mistake, because we all get very tempted, if they can wipe it down with alcohol, would that help? Is that, that help? If you find yeah. that you've contaminated your piece, then use the isopropanol alcohol to wipe it clean before you put resin on. Oui, Epodex, Brilliant. Véronique, Epodex, oui, c'est 100 pour 50. Donc, moitié, moitié, euh, pardon, 100 grammes de, de résine pour 50 grammes de durcisseur. Je ne sais plus quelle était ta question, Véronique, au départ. Donc là, je ne me souviens pas ce que tu avais demandé au départ. Everything sounds so much better in French. I even prefer the way Val says that my company name in French. I'm like, can I just record you? <laughs> Resonance sounds so much nicer coming out of your mouth. <laughs> so Val, we'll try and sneak in a couple, a couple of more questions um, just before we finish up. And like that, thank you so much for being so interactive. And we are going to put another uh, lesson together in a couple of weeks based on all of these questions that I've been taking down today. So please join us for that. Um, but here's, here's one for you, Val. How do you know when your resin is burnt? Well, A, you have probably seen a flame. <laughs> you probably have seen an actual flame um, within your resin. And secondly, you will see when the resin has cured, that there are a lot of pimple areas um, in one very specific area of the artwork. I haven't got any to show you here, but you would see a concentration area where there is like real strong dimples or very strong lines and chances are it is because you overheated or you burnt your resin, which is why especially if you're using the heat torch stay at a distance do not come close stay at a distance 
and move confidently and short, quick bursts of heat. And that's it. You're not burning your resin or heating your resin for 10 or 15 minutes. It's quick, in and out bursts of heat. Brilliant. And um, here's one Val we got. And um, this is a mistake that I made. I think I purchased about three or four different goals before I found my special gold. And it's actually for just for you online uh, UK. The floating gold is amazing. The, the effect it creates on your pieces, the strong gold you get from it. I just cannot recommend it enough. Definitely is a must have for your kit. So this is the gold. I don't know that you can read it properly. It is called Precious gold, floating mm. pigment powder. I purchase it from Just For You Online UK. It is amazing. It works slightly differently than a mica powder or a pigment powder in the sense that although you can mix it with resin and you mix it with resin, when you've mixed it with resin and you put it in your coaster, for example, when you heat it up with your heat torch or your heat gun, what happens is, because it is a floating powder, it comes back to the surface of your coaster and creates these amazing effects of... Um, uh, cells or lacing depending on how much movement you've given it but the powder rises back to the surface unlike all the other mica powders which just mix with resin but they don't float back up so you have this wonderful uh, creation with the uh, gold and you can purchase it in gold silver rose gold or 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 let me see i guess i can never remember spice gold or blazing bronze so these are all the different types of floating pigment powders that you can get from just for you i think i saw a question hang on lisa once there's so many amazing questions after coming through and uh, that we're never going to get to them all. We've already ran over. So I'm kind of conscious of time. Um, but I think it's fair to say we'll do one in a couple of weeks. And if we haven't answered any of your questions, I'm after taking down as many as I can. And um, so myself and Val will revisit all of these the next day. If you do have any in the meantime, please DM myself or Val um, so we can cover some of the topics. Yes, absolutely. Um, it would be really helpful to everybody uh, whose questions did not get answered today for you guys to send us questions um, either in DMs or um, if I have a chance today or tomorrow on this little post I'll put down so that in a couple of weeks or three weeks time we can redo a live and we can then try and deal with some of these other questions. So send us up your questions and we will try and do another live soon and answer as many of those as we can. I hope, Brilliant. And I, I hope you guys have found it useful. Um, obviously, I know there were tons of questions we did not answer, and I'm really sorry for that, but we are a little bit constricted with time. So, yeah, I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful. What do you think, Lisa? Yeah, I think I just love how much interaction we've got and it's great to see that there, you know, there is those little niggly things that the same issue I had and that's why I reached out to you in the first place, Val, those little niggly questions that were just kind of holding me back from, from honing in on the craft. So uh, it's great to see that people have found so much value in today and I'm excited just to do, you know, for our next one already. But for those of you who are kind of want to have a one-on-one -on, -one on Val, I think it's important just for me to mention like what areas she does do um, courses on. So our latest one, Val, was the beautiful geode that you created. Um, the flower effect for coasters. I know some of you did ask a question about the 3D effect. We'll have to cover that one again at a later date. Um, how to do an ocean, uh, ocean setting, which is just beautiful. Even look, Make sure and have a look on Val's page for any of you who haven't, because you will see the range of work that she does, and it's just stunning. So make sure and check that out. 
um, how to do trays, how to do clocks, which is a lovely present for somebody, and um, how to do coasters and um, pictures themselves, how to prep and finish, crystal application and stone placement, glitter and pen lines and also dirty pores. Well, I think I've covered them all. Oh, sorry, there's two other actually to mention. Um, so if you do plan on turning your craft into a business, um, Val does a fantastic um, tutorial on how to grow your Instagram account, which is very important to get your, your work out there to, to people, and also how to just set up and kind of sell your pieces as well. And I know we did, again, get a few questions in about that. Thank you for those questions. Apologies we didn't get to get to them all today, especially the ones in, Fr in French. Sorry, Val, you're going to have to pick those ones up. <laughs> I can't help you there, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you so much for all coming today and as I said bringing your energy making it so interactive Val thank you so much for your time and again it's just you just a wealth of knowledge the Val Encyclopedia is now <laughs> Resident Encyclopedia <laughs> it was not quite but getting there slowly yeah I mean your passion just comes through thank you for being my mentor and um, yeah so I said we look forward to doing this again in a couple of weeks Val Absolutely. Um, I will see you on Tuesday um, for your next lesson. Thank you, yeah. everybody who joined in. Yes, I'm definitely going to make sure I say this. I'm not sure how, but I will try to do this. And I will catch up with any questions and answers. Thank you so much for staying with us, for watching, for commenting. I really hope you enjoyed it. And I will see everybody soon. Bye, Lisa. Thanks, Paul. Bye, Bye, Bye. <laughs> Take care, all. Bye, Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. I'm trying to figure out how to save it. No, I won't, I'm afraid to say I wonder if it save automatically, just so we don't lose all this good content, because I know a lot of people wanted to watch this back. Yep. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> We're still here. We're trying to figure out how to save it. <laughs> we might be here till our lesson on, on Tuesday, Val. <laughs> Thank you so much. Like, I'm not quite yet. I know we're trying to see. <laughs> Thank you for all your kind comments. Lovely to hear. Oh God, this is so funny. I don't know why. I'm scared of pressing cancel to finish this because if it doesn't save, everybody. Does anybody know? Well, does anybody know how to stop this and save it? Because that would be great if you could just like add that into the chat. That would be brilliant. <laughs> okay. Well, look, I'm going. <laughs> because I can't see it anywhere so no. I can't see anything anywhere about saving it now and I can't even look it up um, let me see now great tips oh look thank you for the lovely comments guys it's really, really lovely to see well we're trying not to do it it's a question of being able to save it Bell Arts Decor <laughs> yeah <laughs> So anyway, I'm going to log out and hopefully see what happens. If you never see me again, it's because it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do a take two in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and hopefully get through some different questions. <laughs> All right, sweetheart. I'll see you Tuesday, if not earlier. Great. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.